What's up, everybody? My name is Simon Hill. Hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, share this video, and I'm not going to waste your time. Let's get into it. So this video, I don't know how long it will be, but it will be about the meaning of life, uh, different philosophies on life, what this all comes down to, why we exist, the purpose of our existence. It's something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time because it seems like on, uh, or at least in political discussion, uh, when we talk about these ideas and ideologies that motivate us, nobody seems to talk about the essential question of what their philosophy is on how we are supposed to move in this life that we have, you know, from the cradle to the grave. How do we fill up our time and what is the purpose of all this? And this is a good time to make this video finally, because I watched a movie last night, Everything Everywhere All at Once. It's a new film that came out. This is the poster here. And it was actually really good. It was really good. Um, let's give a brief synopsis of the video. I'll give my uh, I'll give <laughs> not the video. Let's give a brief synopsis of the movie. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, and then uh, we'll also talk about like the, the trailer, what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, everything. So everything, everywhere, all at once is a 2022 American science fiction absurdist comedy drama film written and directed by Dan Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, collectively known as Daniels. The film stars Michelle Yeoh, Stephen Hu, uh, Ki Huang Kwan, Jenny Slate, Harry Shum Jr., James Hong, and Jamie Lee Curtis. The plot follows a Chinese American woman, Yao, uh, Yvette. They called her Yvette in the movie. Maybe I missed that part when they called her UL. Being uh, audited by the Internal Revenue Service, who discovers that she must connect with parallel universe versions of herself to prevent a powerful being from causing the destruction of the multiverse. The film has been described as a swirl of genre anarchy and features elements of dark comedy, science fiction, fantasy films, martial arts films, and animation. I'll play the trailer while I'll give my view of it. I'll mute it so that I don't get a copyright strike or anything. But when I watched the film, uh, the point that became, you know, well, the point that I got from the movie is that we have different philosophies and each of the different characters have a different philosophy of life. I would say Yvette was a realist. The main character, the woman who is the main character is a realist in that she chases materialistic uh, outcomes in life to 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 define it as a good life. There's a scene in the movie, and I'm not going to spoil it, where she sees an alternate version of her life where she became this big singing star and movie star. And she says, oh my God, my life was so great before I met you talking to her husband, right? And then they have her husband, which has a view of life that's very absurdist, very fun, all about just doing kind things, doing good things for people. And this is how he gets through life. Then they have her daughter, whose name is Joy. And I don't think that was an accident. Um, that was an intentional name as a metaphor. Joy's view of life is more nihilistic, at, at essentially nihilistic, meaning that there's no point in life. Nothing has purpose. With all the options that we have, they all lead to sort of the same outcome. And that is that nothing really matters. And uh, I would also say the IRS lady who plays a big part in the movie, uh, her view of life is, you know, very bureaucratic and structured. And there is order. Things must have order. Right. And uh, all these competing views of life sort of uh, create different conflicts between the characters and the outcome of the film and uh i would say i like the cinematography the acting the graphics uh the fight scenes were amazing as you can see here uh it was funny at times it was absurd at times it was kind of dark at times it wasn't a tearjerker i wouldn't say it was the best film i've ever seen but it was definitely a movie that you will remember um uh, there's parts in there that are just so absurd and it's definitely a conversation starter. I would say uh, I would give the film a nine out of 10. Actually, it's that good. So I recommend you to watch it. It's a fun movie to watch on a Saturday night. And uh, the only problem I have, and I'm not going to split hairs about this, it's not a big deal, but I'm just concerned when we have movies about America or the American immigrant experience and we don't have African Americans in the film at all, you know, because I feel like it's almost impossible to tell the story of America, even if this is a Chinese American family who owns a laundromat. 
I mean, how do you not have any black customers, any black characters in the staff? This literally, I went through the whole movie looking and I saw no black people in the movie. You know, maybe there was a biracial light skinned black person and they could claim they had pers uh, a person there. It's not a really big deal. It's not a really, really big deal. I just feel like if we have American films, uh, you can't tell the story of America without telling us, without putting us in the story as well. Not as main characters, not as the primary uh, agents. It's not a really big deal. I don't really fucking care about that point. It's just something I always notice. Um, yeah, I also think the film uh, sort of settled on the idea that nihilism in, its, in itself is bad as a philo philosophical view of life. Uh, and nihilism, if you people don't know, is essentially the idea that nothing really matters. Life goes on. We, we're, we're just born here and then we die and then there's nothing else. Right. Um, I, I got the view that that sort of was the main point of the film, because I'm not going to spoil it. But, uh, you know, the philosophy that wins is one of the other characters that I mentioned before, uh, not the not the main antagonist of the uh, of joy right joy was the nihilist uh <laughs> maybe that is a spoiler anyway it's a great film give it a watch uh but what i'm going to do now is jump to this stanford encyclopedia of philosophy this is a text uh a, an article i would say uh um, you know an introductory paper about different philosophies on the meaning of life. I have not read this before, so I'm going to react to this text as I read it. This is something I've been wanting to talk about forever. Maybe I'll revisit this topic. I'm really into philosophy, and I would like to just get to these main core ideas about, you know, the ideologies that motivate us. So let's not waste any time. Let's get into it. So this is titled The Meaning of Life, first published Tuesday, May 15th, 2007. Substantive Revision, Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. Many major historical figures in philosophy have provided an answer to the question of what, if anything, makes life meaningful, although they typically have not put it in these terms, with such talk having arisen only in the past 250 years or so, on which C. Landau, 1997. Consider, for instance, Aristotle on the human function. Aquinas on the, on the beatific vision, and Kant on the highest good. Relatedly, think about Koheleth, the presumed author of the biblical book Ecclesiastes, describing life as futility and akin to the pursuit of win. Nietzsche on nihilism, as well as Schopenhauer, when he remarks that whenever we reach a goal we have longed for, we discover how vain and empty it is. While these concepts have some bearing on happiness and virtue, and their opposites, they are straightforwardly construed, roughly, as accounts of which higher order final ends, if any, a person ought to realize that would make her life significant. So finding meaning is, I think, the point of all of this. And uh, these different uh, things in life, that these different views of life said by these different uh, philosophers, uh, tried to find the significance or the meaning of our existence is what I hope that they were trying to get at. And it's interesting that we read How Vain and Empty It Is by Schopenhauer when he talked about reaching an end goal, because it's funny, I just watched the Will Smith interview with David Letterman on Netflix, and he explicitly said, you know, all the money and power and prestige I've acquired over his over my life, I have not seen any good from it, you know, and he talked about just letting everything go while doing ayahuasca in Peru. I should also do a video about my ayahuasca experience. Anyway, let's continue. Despite the venerable pedigree, it is only since the 1980s or so that a distinct field of the meaning of life has been established in Anglo-American Australasian philosophy, on which this survey focuses, and it is only in the past 20 years that debate with real depth and intricacy has appeared. Two decades ago, analytic reflection on life's meaning was described as a backwater compared to that on well-being or good character. That's crazy to think about the idea that the the field the f the philosophical field of just focusing what is the purpose and meaning of life was characterized sort of like self-help gurus and and you know 
people that are just trying to have improvement and and be morally good or characteristically good that was considered the same or equal as finding the meaning of life that's funny and it was possible to cite nearly all the literature in a given critical discussion on the field Metz 2002 neither is true any longer anglo-american australasian philosophy of life's meaning has become vibrant such that there is now way too much literature to be able to cite comprehensively in this survey to obtain focus it tends to discuss books influential essays and more recent works and it leaves aside contributions from other philosophical traditions such as the continental or african and from non-philosophical fields uh, for example psychology or literature. This survey's central aim is to acquaint the reader with current analytical approaches to life's meaning, sketching major debates and pointing out neglected topics that merit further dis consideration. This is interesting. My mind is, is sparked. Uh, when the topic of the meaning of life comes up, people tend to pose one of three questions. What are you talking about? What is the meaning of life? And is life in fact meaningful? I agree. These are the three essential uh, <clears throat> questions I, I think would come up. The analytical, the analytic literature can be usefully organized according to which question it seeks to answer. This survey starts off with recent work that addresses the first abstract or meta question regarding the sense of talk of life's meaning. Uh, i.e. that aims to clarify what we have in mind when inquiring into the meaning of life, section one. Afterward, it considers texts that provide answers to the more substantive question about the nature of meaningfulness, section two and three. There, there is in the making a subfield of applied meaning that parallels applied ethics in which meaningfulness is considered in the context of particular cases of specific themes. Yeah, th that's what I was thinking earlier. Like, what does it mean to mean? When we say what is the meaning of life? Meaning, I think, implies a purpose, right? The, the meaning of the bottle, maybe, is to hold water, right? Uh, the meaning of my words is to convey the ideas in my head, right? But when we say life's meaning, I guess life's meaning implies that there is a purpose to it. I'm trying to comprehend. By the way, I only have a bachelor's degree. <laughs> I don't have a master's degree. I didn't study philosophy. I studied music industry studies. So I'm just playing around with ideas. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm literally learning right in front of you. So let's continue. Uh, examples include downshifting, Levy 2005, implementing genetic enhancements, Agar 2013, making achievements, Bradford 2015, getting an education, Schinkel et al. Uh, 2015, interacting with research participants, Olson 2016, automating labor, Donaher 2017, and creating children, Farrah Keoli 2018. In contrast, this survey focuses nearly exclusively on contemporary North normative theoretical approaches to life's meaning, that is, attempts to capture in a single general principle all the variegated, is that variated? Because I've never seen variegated before, variegated conditions that could confer meaning on life. Finally, this survey examines fresh arguments for the nihilistic view that the conditions necessary for a meaningful life do not obtain for any of us i.e. that all our lives are meaningless, section four. So yeah, the parts that we'll look at, the meaning of meaning, supernaturalism, under this we have God-centered views and soul-centered views, naturalism is the third section, subjectivism, objectivism, rejecting God and a soul, nihilism is section four, then the bibliography with the works cited. All right, so let's go to section one, the meaning of meaning. One part of philosophy of life's meaning consists of the systematic attempt to identify what people have in mind when they think about the topic or what they mean by talk of life's meaning. For many in the field, terms such as importance and significance are synonyms of meaningfulness and so are insufficiently revealing. But there are those who draw a distinction between meaningfulness and significance. Uh, Singer, 1996, uh, 112 to 118. Uh, Belli Belliotti, 2019, 145 to 50, 186. Yeah, 
sometimes I think that philosophy or the way we approach these questions, such as the meaning of life, are so stringent and conditioned on the language that we're speaking. Because in English, meaningfulness and significance are very similar in their connotation, generally when we speak. You know, the significance of the uh, of Congress passing this bill, the meaning, the meaningfulness of Congress passing this bill, I would say, are two similar sentences with the same idea. If you say these words to a native English speaker, they will get the same idea. They won't get different interpretations, unlike in other languages where they might have a different word that has different meanings than significance and meaningfulness. You know, as an English teacher, I interact with this all the time. You know, when we say plan and collude, colluding and planning are two different things, right? Planning is just a general idea. I'm planning my vacation. Colluding my <laughs> vacation or conspiring to go on vacation, that sounds more sinister and menacing. So different ideas, even though they're both related to planning something, cr creating a strategy. Anyway, I'll continue. There is also debate about how the concept of meaningless life relates to the ideas of a life that is absurd. Nagel, 1970, 1986, 214 to 2013, Feinberg, 1980, Belia T, 2019, uh, Futile, Tricell, 2002, and Not Worth Living, Landau, 2017, uh, 12 through 15, Matheson, 2017. Yeah, is life absurd? You know, sometimes I think we start off with the wrong question. What is the meaning of life presupposes that there is a meaning. But maybe if the question was, why is life absurd? Or why is life meaningless? Or is there meaning? There might be differences in the outcome of the answer or how we go about finding the answer. Once again, I'm just uh, digressing. We have a long text ahead, so I will take water breaks. And now it's one. Hmm. Let's continue. A useful way to begin to get clear about thinking about life's meaning involves is to life's meaning involves is to specify the bearer. Which life does the inquirer have in mind? A standard distinction to draw is between the meaning in life where a human person is what can exhibit meaning and the meaning of life in the narrow sense where the human species as a whole is what can be meaningful or not that's a very good question that's a very good way of framing the question or, or changing the question are we talking about our individual lives are we talking about the lives of humanity as a whole are we talking about what is the meaning in our lives are we talking about why do we live meaning of life that's very good uh, that makes me have more questions there has been a bit of recent consideration of whether animals or human infants can have meaning in their lives. Wow. With most rejecting that possibility. Example, Wong, 2008, 131, 147, Fisher, 2019, 124. But a handful of others beginning to make a case for it. Pervs and Delon, 2018, Thomas, 2018. Also underexplored is the issue of whether groups such as a people or an organization can be bearers of meaning and if so under what conditions quite interesting to think about infants and animals do they have meaning in their lives i think a lot of the times we as people define others when they cannot speak or when they cannot communicate because once that human infant becomes you know sentient and communicative now they're allowed to have meaning, is what I'm assuming. Meanwhile, animals, maybe, are assumed not to have meaning in their lives, but only that's because they cannot communicate, right? Uh, I think also a lot of times people, when they think about the meaning of life, they compare us to the animals, and animals, as we see, just generally, as far as we know, they're born, they reproduce, they die. And then in between that time, they're just hunting for food or trying to stay alive. And we, as a species, you know, speculative, controversially, this is for debate. We do different things. We don't just struggle to survive. We don't just uh, uh, reproduce. We do other things with our lives, sometimes altruistically, that, that sacrifices other things that would be considered 
important or natural, right? Some people swear off sex for the rest of their lives and become nuns, right? So what is the meaning of life? Because their life is no less valuable because they decided to not have sex. Uh, some people fast for many long periods, harming their own selves, not eating. Does that mean that their life has less meaning? What, some would even say they have more meaning in their life because they're trying to reach another level. But because we don't see that generally with animals, I would say we don't as ascribe the same meaning to their lives. Uh, organizations. Also underexplored is the issue of whether groups such as people or organizations can be bearers of meaning, and if so, under what conditions. I think organizations generally would have some meaning, right? A business, the meaning is to make money. Uh, a nonprofit is to uh, and cause social change. Um, people, I think that's more up for debate. I don't think a people have a meaning. For example, an ethnic group like the Hungarians have no meaning in their existence just as hungarians or maybe not maybe i i don't know let me think about that do maybe their meaning to exist is to define themselves but then again that just seems mm, no i don't see people groups of people or right now individuals having a, a specific meaning but i'm waiting to be convinced i'm not starting off with any presuppositions i just have an open mind and i'm analyzing let's go ahead most analytical philosophers have been interested in meaning in life that is in the meaningfulness that a person's life could exhibit with comparatively few these days addressing the meaning of life in the narrow sense even those who believe that God is or would be central to life's meaning have lately addressed how an individual's life might be meaningful in virtue of God more often than how the human race might be. Although some have argued that the meaningfulness of life as such merits inquiry to no less a degree, if not more than the meaning in a life. Let me read that again, just to make sure. Although some have argued that the meaningfulness of human life as such merits inquiry to no less a degree, if not more than the meaning in a life. Uh, C. Chris 2013, Tartaglia 2015, C. F. Trissel 2016. A large majority of the field has instead been interested in whether their lives as individual persons and the lives of those who they care about are meaningful and how they could become more so you know this is sad that people aren't exploring the big idea of the meaning of life or the meaning why is life meaningful or meaningless rather they're speaking or examining the individual's lives of finding meaning in them i think that starts off with the presupposition that meaning is subjective and a person can define their own meaning to life while I, I while i would hope that the philosophers the people who have thought more deeply about this than i i would hope that somebody would actually focus more on the big big question rather than just the individual questions but maybe from examining the individuals finding meaning in their lives we reach a larger conclusion but i think that's always subjective because you have people from different cultures and backgrounds and and uh viewpoints who will who will who are who are influenced by their environment to say what's meaningful right is your life meaningful because you got an education because you come from a, a culture or family or, or or society that values education highly or and or did you know did having a family having children raise your meaning i think that's uh something to discuss and how we interpret it as well because as we interpret it uh, the people who are analyzing these people's lives, if that's what was happening in that experiment, right? Or if that's what the philosophers are doing, uh, they might also be influenced by the society around them as well. Once again, I digress. Focusing on meaning in life, it is quite common to maintain that it is conceptually something good for its own sake or relative or relatedly something that provides a basic reason for action on which see Visak 2017. There are a few who have recently suggested otherwise maintaining that there can be neutral or even undesirable kinds of meaning in a person's life. Example, uh, Mawson 2016, 9193, 
Thomas 2018 291 294. However, these are outliers, with most analytic philosophers and presumably lay people instead wanting to know when an individual's life exhibits a certain kind of final value or non instrumental reason for action. All right. This was interesting. There are a few who have recently suggested otherwise, maintaining that there can be neutral or even undesirable kinds of meaning in a person's life. Yeah, for example, like the people that they find buried in caves or stones that lived 50,000 years ago, you know, essentially, we could argue those people's lives back then had no meaning, but now they have meaning now because their bodies are used for scientific research to study the history of humanity. That's interesting to think about is the meaning that you give, you know, can we even control what the meaning is? Do others define the meaning for us? Um, so yeah, I think, uh, Finding meaning conceptually something good for its own sake or relatedly something that provides a basic reason for action. Uh, yeah, I think the problem in this question might also be finding meaning as being essentially a good thing, right? Because meaningless, at least once again, I think we go back to language, meaningless in English implies negative. Nobody likes to have nothing, right? Or no meaning no purpose. I think the human brain is in incapable of understanding something having no meaning or no purpose. For if, for if we could, there would have never been the invention of religion or, you know, causes or organizations to change the world. Because if, if it truly had no meaning, this purpose, this existence that we live in, we would all <laughs> sort of kind of wither away in a sense, or we ascribe meaning essentially as good. And we want to achieve meaning. Right. Another claim about which there is substantial consensus is that meaningfulness is not all or nothing and instead comes in degrees such that some periods of life are more meaningful than others and that some lives as a whole are more meaningful than others. Right. For example, I just got married on uh, Friday. Right. Last Friday. And that day, of course, will always be more meaningful than the Thursday that came before it and the Saturday that came after it, right? May 20th will always be a very important day for me. So that day is more meaningful. That makes sense. But when we talk about the totality of life, right, are we calculating days with how many meaningful days that we had? I think, once again, my question coming into this was the meaning, the purpose of our existence as a whole. But I shall continue. All right. Uh, note that one can coherently hold the view that some people's lives are less meaningful or even in a certain sense less important ouch, ouch, than others or are even meaningless, unimportant, and still maintain that people have an actual standing from a moral point of view. That's interesting to think about because once again, you know, I could give the example of the caveman that they find in the cave. His body, his life now had some meaning because it helps us, I would assume, find out more about ourselves, right? Meanwhile, let's say that caveman also killed another caveman and dumped his body in a river and his body has been lost to time. His life might have been meaningless because he didn't leave anything for us, right? Now, uh, I think we're starting off or somebody has to answer this question. And once again, I'm just reading and learning as we go. Is meaning just defined is meaning defined by what we contribute to others? Because like I said, in my caveman example, the person who died 50,000 years ago, he's giving us something knowledge of ourselves. Right. But is that is that his only meaning? Is that the re only reason why he has meaning? Because we can derive something from him. Meanwhile, the other caveman that he hit over the head with the rock and dumped in the river had no meaning because we get nothing from him. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking the questions and I'm also mulling over this in my head. Um, consider a consequentialist moral principle co according to which an individual counts, counts from one in virtue of having a capacity for a meaning 
meaningful life, or a Kantian approach according to which all people have a dignity and virtue of their capacity for autonomous decision-making, where meaning is a function of the exercise of this capacity. For both moral outlooks, we could be required to help people with relatively meaningless lives. Let me reconsider, let me just reread this again to make sure I'm getting it. Consider a consequentialist moral principle according to which each individual counts for one in virtue of having a capacity for a meaningful life, or a Kantian approach according to which all people have a dignity and virtue of their capacity for autonomous decision making, where meaning is a function of the exercise of this capacity, right, where we define meaning because of our free choice in decision making. For both moral outlooks, we could be required to help people with relatively meaningless lives. I think this, I, okay, I reread that again just to make the just to understand that in their point of view, even if you have different philosophical views and you reach a and you reach the conclusion that some people's lives are meaningless, they are still allowed, you know, the right to live, the right to pursue happiness, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they have equal standing with the person who has a more meaningful life for a moral point of view, because even if you view it in a Kantian approach or, uh, you know, different, different philosophical views, these people still have the moral capacity, the actual capacity to make decisions, to live freely, and they don't, uh, they are not morally less or, or worth less than a person whose life was very meaningful. You know, the German soldier was just as important as Hitler in a philosophical uh, sense, uh, even though Hitler had a more meaningful life, which was also an unintentionally meaningful life because he caused a lot of destruction and harm and his legacy is now a lesson on the evils of white supremacy. I can't go a single video without mentioning the WS. It's everywhere, right? Yet another relatively uncontroversial element of the concept of meaningfulness in respect of individual persons is that it is conceptually distinct from happiness or rightness, emphasized in Wolf 2010-2016. First, to ask whether someone's life is meaningful is not one and that same it's not one and the same as asking whether her life is pleasant or she is subjectively well off. Very true. Somewhat. I don't know. I'm, I'm debating. Mm. Is life pleasant if it has no meaning? Or if we don't define meaning on it? Isn't it, isn't it subjective? All right. Uh, a life in an experience machine or virtual reality device would surely be a happy one, but very few take it to be a prima facie candidate for meaningfulness. Interesting. That's an interesting example. If you could live your life in a simulation, uh, where everything was perfect and everything was great, but in reality, you were actually living uh, in a chair, just sitting down. Where's the meaning? It's most people, I would assume, would not choose that if you would choose the actual existence over the fictional one, right? Uh, indeed, a number would say that one's life logically could become meaningful precisely by sacrificing one's well-being. Example, by helping others at the expense of oneself, jumping in front of the bullet, jumping in front of the bullet of the president, right? You're helping many more people and making your life have a lot more meaning than if uh, you didn't, right? <laughs> Uh, second, asking whether a person's existence over time is meaningful is not identical is not identical to considering whether she has been morally upright. There are intuitively ways to enhance meaning that have nothing to do with right action or moral virtue, such as making a scientific discovery or becoming an excellent dancer. Right now, one might argue that a life would be meaningless if or even because it were unhappy or immoral but that would be to posit a synthetic substantive relationship between the concepts far from indicating that speaking of meaningfulness is analytically a matter of connoting ideas regarding happiness or rightness yeah so we can't confound you know happiness or evil or any other ideas that we would have with meaningfulness. Meaningfulness is by itself, okay? Uh, rightness and wrongness 
are separate from meaningfulness is how I am interpreting this, right? Um, the question of what, if anything, makes a person's life meaningful is conceptually distinct from the questions of what makes life happy or moral, although it could turn out that the best answer to the former question appeals to an answer to one of the latter questions. All right. So the best answer to the former question, the question of uh, hold up, what if makes a person's life meaningful, right? is the former question what makes a life meaningful all right appeals to an answer to one of the latter questions what makes a life happy or moral yeah so people i think automatically subscribe meaning as in making life happy and living it in a good way generally uh, i think from what i'm getting here our natural response to reply to the meaning of life for many, many people is just to say, be a good person in a general sense. But nobody breaks down what does it mean to be good or they might have a religious background that defines good in a certain way. But good, I believe, can vary from time, culture, place, society. Uh, and that's why I think also we cannot com confound or, or tie together. Um, uh, meaningfulness and happiness, morality, evil, any other adjectives. Meaningfulness is once again by itself. All right. Supposing then that talk of meaning in life connotes something good for its own sake that can come in degrees and that is not analytically equivalent to happiness or rightness. What else does it involve? What more can we say about this final value by definition? Most contemporary analytic philosophers would say that the relevant value is absent from spending time in an experience machine. But see God's 2012 for a different view or living akin to Sisyphus, the mythic figure doomed by the Greek gods to roll a stone up a hill for eternity, famously discussed by Albert Camus and Taylor in 1970. In addition, many would say that the relevant value is typified by the classic triad of the good, the true and the beautiful or would be under certain conditions. These terms are not to be taken literally, but instead are rough catchwords for beneficent relationships, love, collegiality, morality, intellectual reflection, wisdom, education, discoveries, and creativity, particularly the arts, but also potentially things like humor or gardening. Right. So just to go back then. All right. So supposedly then that talk of meaning of life connotes something good for its own sake that can come in degrees and that is not analytically equivalent to happiness or rightness. What else does it in, what else does it involve? Right. So if we can't tie meaning of life to, you know, good things or bad things. Right. Or good behavior uh, and immoral behavior. So what can we say about the, this final value by definition? So the most relevant philosophers uh, say that the relevant value is absent from spending time in an experience machine, right? So most philosophers would say, and most people I think would agree, you wouldn't spend your life in a simulation even if it was better than your actual life, right? Uh, so, and they compare it to a Greek mythical figure who was tortured. In addition, many would say that the relevant value is typified by the classic triad of good, true, and beautiful. All right. Uh, they would say that essentially the life's meaning would be found in the good things, the true things the and beautiful things, uh, things that are aesthetically pleasing. All right. These terms are not to be taken literally, but instead are rough catchwords for beneficent relationships, love, good, intellectual reflection, wisdom. OK. And creativity, the arts. So life's meaning can be found in these things, our relationships, what we do with our minds and our creativity and how we express ourselves. Okay. All right. I get that. So pressing further, is there something that the values of the good, the true, the beautiful, and any other logically possible sources of meaning involve? There is 
as of yet no consensus in the field. Will there ever be? One salient view is that the concept of meaning in life is a cluster of amalgam of overlapping ideas, such as fulfilling higher order purposes, meriting substantial esteem or admiration, having a noteworthy impact, transcending one's animal's nature, making sense or exhibiting a compelling life story. Marcus 2003, Thompson 2003, Metz 2013, 24 through 35, Seacrest 2013, 3 4, and Moss in 2016. 16. However, there are philosophers who maintain that something much more monistic is true of the concept, so that nearly all thought about meaningfulness in a person's life is essentially about a single property. Hmm. 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 So, hmm, that maybe that nearly all the meaningfulness in a person's life is essentially a single property who maintain that something much more monistic is true. That Okay. Suggestions include being devoted to or in awe of qualitatively superior goods, transcending one's limits, or making a contribution. Right. So, uh, so I think this is the view that many people would have. Uh, many people, I think the majority of the world, would say that life is about or life's meaning can be found in transcending our animal instincts making sense of what the world is living an incredible life like is like if you were an explorer or a great writer or something uh, others would say that life has a single purpose and it's about being in awe of maybe god which i would imagine would be a superior good or maybe uh being in awe of great acts of altruism and self-sacrifice transcending one's limits though i find that very similar to transcending animals instincts because we're limited i would assume or i presuppose by our animal instincts and making a contribution making a contribution how i don't know what that means Recently, there has been something of an interpretive turn in the field, one instance of which is the strong view that meaning talk is logically about whether and how a life is intelligible within a wider frame of reference. Goldman 2018, 1 through 16, 29, Seacrest 2019, Thomas 2019, CF Reps 2018. From now on, moving forward, I won't read the references. Okay, you can see them on the screen here. I'm just going to continue with the text. According to this approach, inquiring into life's meaning is nothing other than seeking out sense-making information, perhaps a narrative about life or an explanation of its source and destiny. This analysis has the advantage of promising to unify a wide array of uses of the term meaning. However, it has the disadvantage of being unable to capture the intuitions that meaning in life is essentially good for its own sake. Yeah. Um... I find this, I find the, the uh, being unable to capture the intuitions, the feeling that meaning in life is essentially good for its own sake. Yeah, as of right now, I reject this idea that life's meaning essentially is good because once again, meaning can be defined in many different ways. It could be a neutral, it could be a negative. The meaning of something can be many different things to many different people, right? And uh, I think our natural inclination inclination or intuition or feeling to believe that life is essentially good or the purpose of it is to be essentially good uh doesn't hold weight uh because there are many people who find meaning in doing activities that are that we would consider wrong or immoral immoral and how we interpret some people in the past or even now uh their meaning to us uh is uh without uh without a uh, positive with without any positive you know feedback like we would say some people in the past are so bad now we derive meaning from them even though that back then they might have been considered good okay uh that is is that all right however it has the disadvantage of being unable to capture the intuition that meaning in life is essentially good for its own sake that it is is not logically contradictory to maintain that an ineffable condition is what confers meaning on life. All right. Uh, and that other human actions themselves, as distinct from an interpretation of them, such as rescuing a child from a burning building, are what bear meaning. Interesting. Interesting. 
Some thinkers have suggested that a complete analysis of the concept of life's meaning should include what has been called antimatter or anti-meaning conditions that reduce the meaningfulness of a life. The thought is that meaning is well represented by a bipolar scale where there is a dimension of not merely positive conditions, but also negative ones. Gratuitous cruelty or destructiveness are prima facie candidates for actions that are not me that not merely fail to add meaning, but also subtract from any meaning one's life might have had. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, 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 once again, I disagree with this. Um, I can't, I think, when we say anti-matter or anti-meaning, I think it would be a better interpretation to say that somebody's life, for example, had meaning, right? Let's take Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan left a big impact on the world, and many people would say his life had meaning because his life had consequences. But I think the anti-meaning could be in his life is that he's dead. Essentially, we all die. And you cannot continue to affect the world after a certain amount of time. After a long enough time span in, our, in the linear t frame of the universe, in the linear time of the universe, everything will go to zero. And some things will have no meaning anymore. There will be a time when the Bible, the most important book ever written, will not be around and will have no meaning over a long enough time span. The same would go for the Quran, for any book, right? That's an example I would think that's a better interpretation of anti-meaning. But what they said here, or what some the philosophers think, is that anti-meaning in somebody's life, for example, Ronald Reagan might have done something good, like defeat the Soviet Union, if you believe that the Soviet Union was bad. But he also, I don't know, helped create the AIDS epidemic, for example. Therefore, his life has less meaning. For I think that's bad. Also, another one could say, someone else could say, Hitler, for example, uh, his life had less meaning than even mine because he did gratuitous amounts of violence or cruelty and destruction. I think that's bad philosophy or bad thinking. In my opinion, this is just my opinion. I'm just a guy reading the text and learning as I go. So despite the ongoing debates about how to analyze the concept of life's meaning or articulate the definition of the phrase meaning in life, the field remains in a good position to make progress on other key questions posed about uh, viz of what would make a life meaningful and whether any lives are in fact meaningful. A certain amount of common ground is provided by the point that meaningfulness at least involves a gradient final value in a person's life that is conceptually distinct from happiness and rightness. All right, a certain amount of common ground is provided by the point that meaningfulness at least involves a gradient final value in a person's life that is conceptually distinct from happiness and rightness. So we're at least starting on this, that meaning has no relation at all to whether it was a moral life or an immoral life or whether it was a happy life or an unhappy life. The, the, the premise that we're starting with is that meaning is something else, right? Uh, ba, 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 ba. so meaningfulness of essentially seen from happiness and rightness with exemplars of it potentially being the good, the true and the beautiful. The rest of this discussion addresses philosophical attempts to capture the nature of this value theoretically and to ascertain whether it exists in at least some of our lives. Hmm. Okay, so let's go to part two, supernaturalism. Mm, water break time. <clears throat> All right. Supernaturalism. I'm not that familiar with this topic. So most analytic philosophers writing on meaning and life have been trying to develop and evaluate theories, i.e. fundamental and general principles that are meant to capture all of the particular ways that a life could obtain meaning. As in moral philosophy, there are recognizable anti-theories, that is, those who maintain that there is too much pluralism among meaning conditions to be able to unify them in the form of a principle, meaning that there are too many Meaning that there are too many different competing ideas, I believe, that 
this is what it says to make us actually have an understanding of the meaning of life because there's too many different interpretations of what meaning is and also what would be a meaningful life or finding the meaning in it right because there's too many interpretations arguably though the systematic search for unity is too nascent to be able to draw a firm conclusion about whether it is available all right the theories are standardly divided on a metaphysical basis, that is, in terms of which kinds of properties are held to constitute the meaning. Supernaturalist theories are views according to which a spiritual realm is central to meaning in life. Most Western philosophers have conceived of the spiritual in terms of God or, or a soul as commonly understood in the Abrahamic faiths. But see Mulgan 2015 for discussion on meaning in the context of a God uninterested in us. Ooh, that's that's interesting to think about. In contrast, naturalist theories are views that the physical world, as known particularly well by the scientific method, is central to life's meaning. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, let me just break this down or at least talk about this. Okay. Uh, theories are standardly divided on a metaphysical basis, that is, in terms of which kinds of properties are held to constitute the meaning. All right. Uh, as I understand this, I think what they're trying to say, um, the physical world is what helps us define the meaning for our actual existence. I'm mulling over this in my head. Supernaturalist theories are views according to which a spiritual realm is central to meaning in life. So the supernatural worldview is where we have things that are outside of the physical world that we cannot actually see or interact with directly that help define life's meaning. Most Western philosophers have conceived of the spiritual in terms of God, right? There's the Adhan playing right now. And even though this isn't the Western world, God is prevalent as an idea throughout the world. Uh, it's commonly understood in the Abrahamic faiths. What I'm very interested here is f defining meaning in a theistic point of view. If there is a God, but he is uninterested in us, there is a grand creator. What is then the meaning? Do we have to ask him or her directly to find out the meaning what was the purpose of his creation that is very interesting to read into in contrast naturalist theories are views that the physical world as known particularly well by the scientific method is central to life's meaning and i think that's where if you have the naturalist view you would say you know the purpose in life is just to eat sleep fuck repeat until you're six feet deep right those are bars uh yeah the naturalist worldview would just say we're just meant here to die and reproduce there is logical space for a non-naturalist theory according to which central to meaning is an abstract property that is neither spiritual nor physical however only scant attention has been paid to this possibility in the recent anglo-american australasian literature all right it is important to note that supernaturalism a claim that god or a soul would confer meaning on a life is logically distinct from theism the claim that god or a soul exists okay so supernaturalism would argue or say that god if he does exist would give meaning and it's different than actually believing in god or believing that a soul actually exists and making that claim Okay. Although most would hold supernaturalism also hold theism, uh, one could accept the former without the latter. You could accept supernaturalism without accepting theism, as Camus more or less did, committing one to the view that life is meaningless or at least lacks substantial meaning. So that's interesting. You can be a supernaturalist nihilist. Interesting. Similarly, while most naturalists are atheists, it is not contradictory to maintain that God exists but has nothing to do with meaning in life or perhaps even detracts from it. Interesting. It would also be interesting to question this. If there is a God, if I'm a supernaturalist anti-theist or if I'm a supernaturalist atheist, if there is a God and he created all of us, could he only have meaning? Meaning he created us to help us serve his meaning rather than us having meaning. Would God's meaning just be defined by us? 
I don't know. That's something interesting to think about. Um, similarly, while most naturalists are atheists, it is not contradictory to maintain that God exists, but has nothing to do with meaning in life or perhaps even detracts from it. Although these combinations of positions are logically possible, some of them might be substance, substantively implausible. Although these combinations of positions are logically possible, some of them might be substantively implausible. Okay. All right. Yeah. So even though you could be a supernaturalist, atheist, nihilist, etc., some of them at one point you will reach a contradiction in your uh, line of thinking. That's what this sentence says. All right. This is getting deep. This is getting deep. The more you read, the more you have to reread over and over again just to make sure you're catching all the ideas so i'm make sh i'm now i feel a hundred percent certain i know exactly what's going on this whole time i did but as as we get deeper into this text we have to dig more and more in our minds you know to make sure that we're understanding everything clearly all right so the field could benefit from discussion of the comparative attractiveness of various combinations of evaluative claims about what make life meaningful and metaphysical claims about whether spiritual conditions exist yeah so there's a lot to discuss there and i just brought up one question right there and i think there's a lot to be said just about that question of whether god has meaning defined by us rather than him ascribing meaning to us this supernatural view could uh be explored more so over the past 15 years or so two different types of supernaturalism have been distinguished on a regular basis uh that is true not only in the literature on life's meaning but also in in that on the related pro-theism, anti-theism debate about whether it would be desirable for God or a soul to exist. Hmm. Mm. On the one hand, there is extreme supernaturalism, according to which spiritual conditions are necessary for any meaning in life. If neither God nor a soul exists, then by this view, everyone's life is meaningless. Yeah, that's extreme supernaturalism. On the other hand, there is moderate supernaturalism, according to which spiritual conditions are necessary for a great or ultimate meaning in life. Okay? Although not meaning in life as such. Okay. If neither God nor a soul exists, then by this view, everyone's life could have some meaning or even be meaningful, but no one's life could exhibit the most desirable meaning. That's interesting. I would argue if you have this view, if you have moderate supernaturalism, we are all born with meaningless lives, but define them as meaningful. That's what I would say if you had this moderate supernaturalist worldview. But I guess the philosophers before have come to the conclusion no one's life could exhibit the most desirable meaning meaning that if there was no god or no soul the most desirable outcome can never be reached interesting for a moderate supernaturalist god or a soul would substantially enhance meaningfulness or be a major contributory condition for it interesting there are a variety of ways that great or ultimate meaning has been described, sometimes quantitatively as infinite, qualitatively as deeper, relationally as unlimited, temporally as eternal, and perspectively as from the point of view of the universe. There has been no reflection as yet on the crucial question of how these distinctions might bear on each other. For instance, on whether some are more basic than others or some are more valuable than others. Uh, somebody needs to reflect on this, so I guess I'll be the one to do it. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's done this before. Um, there are a variety of ways that a greater ultimate meaning has been described, sometimes qualit quantitatively as infinite. So describing the meaning of life as infinite, hmm, qualitatively as deeper, a deeper meaning, relationally as unlimited, hmm, and temporally as eternal, and perspectively as from the point of view of the universe. Okay, so right now I wouldn't subscribe to supernaturalism, so I wouldn't feel qualified in a way to talk about whether these deeper meanings are these 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 adjectives for describing the meaning of life are of different merits 
or of different values. As somebody who doesn't subscribe to supernaturalism as of right now, uh, I wouldn't feel justified digging into this, but I understand what's happening here. Okay. So cross-cutting the extreme moderate distinction is one between God-centered theories and soul-centered ones. Okay. According to the former, some kind of connection with God understood to be a spiritual person who is all knowing, all good and all powerful and who is the ground of the physical universe constitutes meaning in life. Okay. So having a connection to God would be the meaning in life for, you know, for some extreme or moderate uh, supernaturalist, even if one lacks a soul. Uh, construed as an immortal spiritual substance that contains one's identity. In contrast, by the latter, having a soul and putting it into a certain state is what makes life meaningful, even if God does not exist. Many supernaturalists, of course, of course, believe that God and a soul are jointly necessary for a greatly meaningful existence. Interesting. However, the simpler view that only one of them is necessary is common, and sometimes arguments proffered for the complex view fail to support it any more than the simpler one. Okay. Um, in contra All right. Let's just read over this one more time. So, according to the former, according to the former extreme, some kind of connection with God is... Uh, some uh, constitutes meaning in life, even if you lack a soul construed as an immortal spiritual substance that contains one's identity. Yeah, it, I think it would be very hard to find a extreme supernaturalist uh, as somebody who would also believe the soul doesn't exist. Right. But let's say there is. Um, I don't see how. Uh, having your not having a soul would be able to contact be in contact with god right i think the soul would be essential for an extreme supernaturalist then again in contrast by the latter moderate supernaturalist having a soul and putting it into a certain state is what makes life meaningful so having a soul and making it in connect connected with god uh or making a soul that's clean and pure by doing certain things probably creates the uh the meaning even if god does not exist once again i would find it hard to find a moderate supernaturalist or any supernaturalist that would argue a soul exists but not god right because i think it would be essential to have god as the creator of your soul and to also make it the connective tissue the umbilical cord if you will that connects humans to the divine um, many supernaturalists, of course, believe that God and a soul are jointly necessary for a greatly meaningful experience. Yeah. Uh, however, the simpler view that only one of them is necessary, the soul or God is common. I find that hard to believe. And sometimes arguments proffered for the complex view fail to support it any more than the simpler one. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think... Sometimes the arguments preferred for the complex view fail to support it more than the simpler one. Yeah, of course, because, you know, proving and disproving God are damn near impossible, uh, and along with the soul as well, you know, because it's something supernatural. It's above any natural observation, obviously, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, as a, I think this is, as, as we finish this part, on supernaturalism i think it comes and I, I think this is the time to talk about my religious beliefs i identify as a muslim i believe in god i think i have a theistic view of god but i identify as a muslim because i believe that the habits and practices and the ideas of the Islamic tradition are the best ones if you want to live a morally good life, not a life with meaning, because I think the meaning of life as according to Islam is to worship God, right? And I think we're going to get into that in the God-centered views. Uh, to live a morally good life, I believe, is to be uh, the ideal Muslim, right? Um, but 
as I think about the meaning of life, I find it hard uh, at some times to reconcile the purpose of our existence with just the worship of a being. Um, that's the hardest part. And I know that's the essential core of Muslim, right? Muslim means one who submits to the will of God, right? Uh, it's just hard finding meaning in that. But I've also uh, come to some conclusion prior to reading this, and I'm trying to challenge my ideas by reading this text, that life's meaning is once is subjective. So I, as a Muslim, define the meaning of my life as if, if I was a full practicing 100% devoted Muslim. The meaning in my life would come from me fully submitting to the will of God, right? Uh, fully submitting to knowing, not knowing what will happen next, knowing that it's been predetermined and knowing that my purpose is here to worship the creator until I am in paradise, inshallah, right? That would be my meaning. But I would also think the meaning for a Christian would be to live like Jesus, the Jew to follow the Talmud and et cetera, et cetera, for a religious person. So, and even for a non-religious person, if you were a humanist or a secular atheist, something like that, the, the, the purpose of your life would be whatever you define it as individually. That was the view that I had about life coming into this text. And that's, and that's partially been influenced, uh, greatly be, been influenced, I should say, by my religious beliefs as a culturally non-practicing Muslim who still identifies as Muslim. Aren't we all full of ironies and contradictions? Let's continue. 2-1, God Center Views. Water break. <coughs> all right. Hit the like button, subscribe if you're still watching this far. Let me just make sure OBS is still running. Yep. Still recording. Good. Let's continue. So, God-centered views. The most influential God-based account of meaning in life has been the extreme view that one's existence is significant if and only if one fulfills a purpose God has assigned. Yeah, that's been, I believe, the longest running view of life, right? That we were meant here to worship Jesus or worship Allah, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't do that, you're falling short of your meaning. The familiar idea is that God has a plan for the universe and that one's life is meaningful just to the degree that one helps God realize this plan, perhaps in a particular way that God wants one to do so. If a person failed to do what God intends her to do with her life, or if God doesn't, does not even exist, one on the current view, her life would be meaningless. Okay, so I think I understand maybe the, su the supernaturalist view. I think what they're saying is the supernaturalist would view, even if you do not believe that God exists, but you identify as religious or you say you subscribe to religious beliefs or God's commandments, your meaning in life is then defined by what those beliefs are. So even though no, neither the religious or non-religious person can prove that God exists, the religious person is in the burden of having to fulfill the purpose of their existence as ascribed by their God or their religious book. That's what I now understand, or at least that's how I've interpreted it. Thinkers differ over what it is about God's purpose that might make it uniquely able to confirm meaning on human lives. But the most influential argument has been that only God's purpose could be the source of invariant moral rules or of objective values more generally, where a lack of such would render our lives nonsensical. So th this is essentially saying that God provides morality. You know, that was one of the stupidest things I heard as a kid when I was challenging my religious beliefs in like high school and stuff. People would say, how can you not believe in God? If you don't believe in God, you'll just do evil stuff. You'll just kill people or whatever, right? That's dumb. It's really dumb. Really dumb to say, honestly. But the most, um, yeah, God's, God's law is the invariant moral rules of the universe. I mean... Once again, I think if you view this in a naturalistic way, 
we can almost invariably prove without a doubt that the Bible and then all books, all religious books were written by men. Therefore, these aren't invariant moral rules. These were rules for a certain set of culture and time, and they're not meant to be moral laws. All right. Uh, according to this argument, lower goods such as animal pleasure or desire satisf satisf satisfaction could exist without God, but higher ones pertaining to meaning in life, particularly moral, vir moral virtue, could not. So we could fuck and have fun, right, without God being here, but higher meanings, higher goods could not exist without God. However, critics point to many non-moral sources of meaning in life, with one arguing that a universal moral code is not necessary for meaning in life, even if, say, beneficent actions are, okay? Not necessary for a meaning in life, all right? Yeah, so the God, God's law might say, you know, treat your neighbor nice, right? And that might be necessary for people to treat their neighbor nice. They have to be told by God's law in a book that to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> but <laughs> those things are not necessary for finding meaning in life, right? Good actions can follow from strange sources, but that doesn't mean that meaning in life is defined by these universal moral codes. The law doesn't define meaning, I would say. In addition, there are a variety of naturalist and non-naturalist accounts of objective morality and of value more generally on offer these days so that it is not clear that it must have a supernatural source in God's will. All right. One recurrent objection to the idea that God's purpose could make life meaningful is that if God had created us with a purpose in mind, then God would have degraded us and thereby undercut the possibility of us obtaining meaning from fulfilling the purpose. That's such a great argument. How can there be meaning in the life if it was already subscribed to us, right? Uh, obtaining meaning from fulfilling the purpose. Yeah, he... If, if God really created us with a meaning for ourselves, right, how could the meaning be uh, really derived or come to as a conclusion if it was already planned and prescribed for us? And the possibility of us obtaining meaning from fulfilling the purpose, it couldn't have happened if it's already been predetermined, right? And also... If uh, if uh, he was given, he gave the meaning to us already, right? There is no meaning that can be defined if we cannot go on the search for it ourselves. The objection harks back to John Paul Sartre, uh, but in the analytic literature, it appears that Kurt Baer was the first to articulate it. All right. Uh, sometimes the concern is that the threat of punishment up God would make so that we do God's bidding, while other times it is that the source of meaning would be constrictive and not up to us. And still other times it is that our dignity would be maligned simply by having been created with a certain end in mind. Okay, yeah, so once again, you know, predestination and predetermination creates so many problems when it comes to morality, when it comes to free will, when it comes to, without saying, uh, meaning in life, right? Because if it's been predetermined or if we're scared of the punishment of not doing what was prescribed to us, where's the actual meaning then? And where's also the good in any of our actions uh, if it's been planned for us either to do evil or good, right? There is a different argument for an extreme God-based view that focuses less on God as pur purpose purposive and more on God as infinite, unlimited, or ineffable, which Robert Nozick first articulated with care. The core idea is that for a finite condition to be meaningful, it must obtain its meaning from another condition that has meaning. The core idea is that for a finite condition to be meaningful, it must obtain its meaning from another condition that has meaning. Interesting. So if one's life is meaningful, it might be so in virtue of being married to a person who is important. Being finite, the spouse must obtain his or her importance from elsewhere, perhaps from the sort of work he or she does. This work must also be 
must also obtain its meaning by being related to something else that is meaningful and so on the dialectic here is so powerful that, that you know something is only someone is only rich because someone is poor someone is only tall because someone is short right and so meaning can only be obtained by finding something else that is meaningless and i think this also goes back to the animals that we spoke about before we have to say we have to say we are meaningful because animals cannot do what we do therefore our meaning is defined by the meaningless creatures in relation to them uh, that's interesting to think about very interesting to think about a regress on meaningful conditions is present and the subject and the suggestion is that the regress can terminate only in something so all encompassing that it need not indeed cannot go beyond itself to obtain meaning from anything else. A regress on meaning conditions is meaningful conditions is present and the suggestion is that the regress can terminate only in something so all encompassing that it need not indeed cannot go beyond itself to obtain meaning from anything else. Interesting. I think what they're saying here in this sentence is, okay, meaning is here, it's present, and the regress can terminate in something the meaning in it because you have to always regress to find the meaning in something therefore the meaning was never there or essentially it might also be saying that the meaning of anything is just related to the meaninglessness of something else all right but i think what i first said was more of my argument i think what i said here First, is that because you have to regress all the time to find meaning, there is no essential meaning, right? That's more of my opinion. And rather, what they're saying here in this text, a regress on meaningful conditions is present, and the suggestion is that the regress can terminate only in something so all-encompassing that it need not, indeed cannot, go beyond itself to attain meaning from any, uh, anything else. And that is God, Okay. All right, I should have read the next sentence. And that is God. Go beyond itself to obtain meaning from anything else. The standard objection is that relational rationale is that a finite condition could be meaningful without obtaining its meaning from another meaningful condition. The standard objection to this rationale, to this relational rationale, is that a finite condition could be meaningful without obtaining its meaning from another meaningful condition okay yeah is the standard objection to this idea that regress is how we find meaning uh is that something can be meaningful without obtaining meaning from another condition but can it can it really can it does water find meaning because i need it or because it's not fire right this is actually my mind working right now i'm really trying perhaps it could be meaningful in itself <clears throat> without being connected to something beyond it or maybe it could obtain its meaning by being related to something else that is beautiful or otherwise valuable for its own sake but not meaningful yeah i kind of disagree right maybe like for example art right the mona lisa right the mona lisa has meaning because it's an ancient piece of art created by a great inventor, right? Someone could potentially buy the Mona Lisa for, let's say, $100 billion, right? And why could they buy it for $100 billion? Because dollars have value and meaning. Where do the dollars find meaning? In our daily lives, because we exchange dollars for goods and services. And why do we exchange them for goods and services? Because goods are things that have meaning to us because we need them to live and the services that people provide for us give us also meaning right why do people have to work because they need money to survive and also some people would say we derive meaning from our occupations i'm just you could just go down the rabbit hole right i guess uh so 
A serious concern for any extreme God-based view is the existence of apparent counterexamples. If we think of the stereotypical lives of Albert Einstein, Mother Teresa, and Pablo Picasso, they seem meaningful even if we suppose there is no all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good spiritual person who is the ground of the physical world. Even religiously inclined philosophers have found this hard to deny these days, right? Yeah, so supernaturalism runs into a problem when we have, you know, great people that existed uh, and they seem to have meaningful, purposeful lives. And, um, you know, they they were not generally motivated by God or they created their morality and left a good impact on the world without deriving it from some sort of spiritual uh, morality. Uh, largely for that reason, contemporary supernaturalists have tended to opt for moderation. That is to maintain that God would greatly enhance the meaning in our lives, even if some meaning would be possible in a world without God. One approach is to invoke the re relational argument to show that God is necessary, not for meaning whatsoever, but rather for an ultimate meaning. Limited transcendence, the transcending of our limits so as to connect with a wider context of value, which itself is limited, does give our lives meaning, but a limited one. We may thirst for more. Another angle is to appeal to playing a role in God's plan, again to claim not that it is essential for meaning as such, but rather for a cosmic significance instead of a significance very limited in time and space. Yeah, I don't understand how supernaturalists uh, could say that life could have meaning without God right? I'm understand, trying to understand them. Because if you're a supernaturalist, I think it's almost essential that you that your God would play some purpose in the existence, right? Because the meaning would have to be that God either created us, A, to serve his or her purpose, right? To define meaning for God, for God's essential uh, conclusion or meaningful summation of existence, or B, that God created you for a meaning independent, maybe of that cosmic summation of existence, right? I cannot find a single way that if you are a supernaturalist and you believe that God exists, that there would be some other meaning that you could define him, even if uh, he didn't exist, right? Or even if you didn't believe he existed. Yeah, that's hard. Uh, so, okay, let's see. Did I finish reading this paragraph? All right. Another rationale is by feeling God's purpose, we would meaningfully please God, a perfect person, as well as be remembered favorably by God forever. Still another argument is that only with God could the deepest desires of human nature be satisfied, even if more surface desires could be satisfied without God. Interesting. So we need spiritual nourishment from God's teat. In reply to such rationales for a moderate supernaturalism, there has been the suggestion that it is precisely by virtue of being alone in the universe that our lives would be particularly significant. Otherwise, God's greatness would overshadow us. There has also been the response that with the opportunity for greater meaning from God would also come that for great or anti-meaning, so that it is not clear that a world with God would offer a net gain in respect of meaning. For example, if pleasing God would greatly enhance meaning in our lives, then presumably displeasing God would greatly reduce it and to a comparable degree. In addition, there are arguments for extreme naturalism or its anti-theist cousin mentioned below, subsection 3.3. 3. So, uh, yeah, I think I've said enough about the God-centered view and supernaturalism at that water break time. <coughs> if you're enjoying this video, hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment. Let's continue. Soul-centered views. Notice that none of the above arguments for supernaturalism appeals to the prospect of eternal life, at least not explicitly. Yeah, that was interesting. You would think that would come up. Arguments that, oh, if there is eternal life, what is the meaning of the eternal life? What is the meaning of the eternal life? Once again, I think, once again, I think the supernaturalist cannot say that 
there is meaning in life with or without God, or meaning can be defined without God, right? Uh, because a lot of supernaturalists, I assume are religious, even if they're not, right? But the majority of supernaturalists, I believe, would be religious. They would argue that we will have eternal life, but then what would be the purpose of the eternal life? Is it to serve God forever? I don't know. Arguments that do make such an appeal are soul-centered, holding that meaning in life mainly comes from having an immortal spiritual substance that is contiguous with one's body when it is alive and that will forever outlive its death. Some think of the afterlife in terms of one's soul entering a transcendent spiritual realm, heaven, while others conceive of one's soul getting reincarnated into another body on earth. According to the extreme version, if one has a soul but fails to put it in the right state or if one lacks a soul altogether then one's life is meaningless there are three prominent arguments for an extreme soul-based perspective one argument made famous by leo tolstoy is the suggestion that for life to be meaningful something must be worth doing that something is worth doing only if it will make a permanent difference to the world and that doing so requires being immortal so is he saying that it's impossible I don't know. Critics often appeal to counterexamples, suggesting, for instance, that it is surely worth your time and effort to help prevent people from suffering, even if you and they are mortal. Indeed, some have gone on the offensive and argue that helping people is worth the sacrifice only if and because they are mortal. Interesting. For otherwise, they would invariably be compensated in an afterlife. Another recent and interesting criticism is that the major motivations for the claim that nothing matters if one day it will end are incoherent. All right. Yeah. Uh, once again, I think as much as we tried to get away from talking about morality and happiness and what's good and what's evil, um, it seems like we're essentially coming back to the question of doing the right things provides meaning is what I'm getting uh, from that. Um, when I said earlier, is it possible or is what Tolstoy is saying, is he trying to say it's impossible? Tolstoy said the suggestion that for life to be meaningful must be worth doing, that something is worth doing only if it will make a permanent difference to the world and that doing so requires being immortal. Uh, so then I think what he's saying, because we cannot permanently live forever, uh, we cannot live and for on this earth forever are we only it's the only meaningful action something that can be done forever right and because that can't be done does that mean life is meaningless i would say tolstoy obviously outlived his time on earth his writings have outlasted people have heard of him on all corners of this planet and his mind still influences us today but once again like i said earlier all things in this world will have a certain time span there will come a time when even tolstoy's name will be forgotten so will he no longer have meaning will the meaning run out does meaning have a time limit a capsule I would argue it does, maybe. A second argument for the view that life would be meaningless without a soul is that it is necessary for justice to be done, which in turn is necessary for a meaning in life. Life seems nonsensical when the wicked flourish and the righteous suffer, at least supposing there is no other world in which these injustices will be rectified, whether by God or a karmic force. Yeah, so I the soul... The, these soul viewed people the people with the view that the soul is necessary i think once again are defining morality by uh an inner core that is you know indescribable and uh, you know in islam they call this uh the fitra not fitna which is corruption but fitra is like the idea that your soul tells you what's wrong you, we naturally as people naturally know what not to do as as morality um but i think we can't define the soul as just uh uh hold on my wife is at the door let me get that i'll be right back maybe i could pause this hold on no i won't pause i'll just keep recording okay
all right so my wife is back but anyway yeah when it comes to this uh soul stuff i don't see how the soul naturally can define morality because i think morality is very subjective uh subject to time and space and i don't see how this would make sense all right continuing something like this argument can be found in ecclesiastes which is a book in the bible and it continues to be defended however even granting that an afterlife is required for perfectly just outcomes it is far from obvious that an eternal life is necessary for them and then there is the suggestion that some lives such as mandela's have been meaningful precisely in virtue of encountering injustice and fighting it but i think injustice is subjective right because you know mandela fighting apartheid some people would say is good some people would say is bad so because there is no universal uh claim to goodness could anything be considered unjust right there's only circumstance and what we define as a unjust circumstance for a time because there was a time apartheid was perfectly fine right a third argument for thinking that having a soul is essential for any meaning is that it is required to have the sort of free will without which our lives would be meaningless. Immanuel Kant is known for having maintained that if we were merely physical beings subjected to the laws of nature, like everything else in the material world, then we could not act for moral reasons and hence would be unimportant. More recently, one theologian has eloquently put the point in religious terms. The moral spirit finds the meaning of life in choice. It finds it in that which proceeds from man and remains with him as his inner essence, rather than in the accidents of circumstances, turns of external fortune. Whenever a human being rubs the lamp of his moral conscience, a spirit does appear. This spirit is God. It is in the thou must of God and man's I can that the divine image of God and human life is contained. That's beautiful poetry. But is it true? Is it true? Yeah, uh, subject to the laws of nature, like everything else, then we could not act for moral reasons and hence will be unimportant. Uh, and then the theologian, whoever, yeah, this was Swenson who said this. Basically, he's saying we find morality in life when we have our thoughts and question our thoughts. And when we, before we make decisions and decide what's moral or immoral to do. Uh, that's when we have God, when these two forces collide or when these two actions transpire in the mind, that's when God appears. And that's when we also think of the commandments and when we think of what we can do and can't do and then make decisions moving forward. Uh, notice that even if moral norms did not spring from God's commands, the logic of the argument entails that one's life could be meaningful so long as one had the inherent ability to make the morally correct choice in any situation. Okay. The logic of the argument entails that one's life could be meaningful so long as one had the inherent ability to make the morally correct choice in any situation. Uh, once again, I don't see the correlation between morality and meaningfulness. Uh, yeah, I think we're at a lower level of the argument now rather than the upper deck where we need to be when we're talking about making morally correct choices and the meaning of our existence two different things that in turn arguably requires something non-physical about oneself so as to be able to overcome whichever physical laws and forces one might confront the standard objection to this reasoning is to advance a compatibilism compatibilism about having a determined physical nature and being able to act for moral reasons it is also worth wondering whether if one had to have a spiritual essence in order to make free choices, it would have to be one that never perished. Like God-centered theorists, many soul-centered theorists these days advance a moderate view, accepting that some meaning in life would be possible without immortality, but arguing that a much greater meaning would be possible with it. Granting that Einstein, Mandela, and Picasso had somewhat meaningful lives despite not having survived the deaths of their bodies, there remains a powerful thought. More is better. 
it is a finite life with the good, the true, and the beautiful has meaning in it to some degree, then surely it would have all the more meaning if it exhibited such higher values, including a relationship with God for an eternity. One objection to this reasoning is that the infinity of meaning that would be possible with the soul would be too big, rendering it difficult for the moderate supernaturalist to make sense of the intuition that a finite life such as Einstein's can indeed count as meaningful by comparison. To rendering it, one objection to this reasoning is that the infinity of meaning that would be possible for a soul would be too big, rendering it difficult for the moderate supernaturalist to make sense of the intuition that a finite life such as Einstein's can indeed count as meaningful by comparison. So if I'm understanding this right, the supernaturalist would argue that Einstein, Einstein's life uh, has less meaning than just the regular, you know, soul-believing supernaturalist. Um, that's an argument to make. That's an argument to make. It's something to consider. Uh, more common, though, is the objection that an eternal life would include anti-meaning of various kinds, such as boredom and repetition discussed below in the context of extreme naturalism. Right. So after uh, completing this part on supernaturalism and as we move into part three, uh, I'm not really... It's interesting for me because I'm I'm sort of on the fence with supernaturalism. As I expressed, you know, I have religious beliefs, but when it comes to meaning, is my meaning going to be defined by the theology or ideology I subscribe to, or will the meaning be defined by something that I can't even uh, fathom? Is the meaning out of my hands? I think what I'm looking for is the essential truth of what is the meaning. And as of right now, I'm of the conclusion that the meaning for all of this is really subjective. But uh, morality is not tied to meaning. Goodness is not tied to meaning. Evil is not tied to meaning. Meaning can be defined by relation to others. I think what I read earlier when they said, uh, you know, Somebody has meaning because they're married to an important person and that person is only important because they have a certain job and that certain job has certain meanings because it's important to the society. I think that uh, description of meaning or understanding of meaning is very useful, right? Uh, naturalism is part three. Recall that naturalism is the view that a physical life is central to life's meaning, that even if there is no spiritual realm, a substantially meaningful life is possible. Like supernaturalism, contemporary naturalism admits of two distinguishable variants, moderate and extreme, METS 2019. The moderate version is that while a genuinely meaningful life could be had in a purely physical universe, as well as as known well by science, a somewhat more meaningful life would be possible if a spiritual realm also existed. God or a soul could enhance meaning in life, although they would not be major contributors. The extreme version of naturalism is the view that it would be better in respect of life's meaning if there were no spiritual realm. From this perspective, God or a soul would be antimatter, i.e. would detract from the meaning available to us making a purely physical world, even if not this particular one preferable. So, you know what? Because this uh, text is broken down into four parts, I'm going to break up this video series into into two parts, easily dividable. We'll break. We'll get into naturalism tomorrow, uh, because we looked at supernaturalism, the meaning of meaning, etc. And we'll dig into this uh, actually tomorrow, because you have to know when to give your brain a rest. Your brain is a muscle, just like your biceps, right? You can't just constantly do curls. So thank you for watching. Thanks for checking out this video. Leave a comment, subscribe, share this video, and peace.